I'd like to invite Michael uh, to join the conversation, Michael Ramadama, and you've been involved in uh, school strikes, including in uh, uh, ch preparing for church worship. Uh, you know, why are you involved? When we spoke briefly, you said God is love, God is just, and what's happening to our peoples and our land is unjust. Speak to that. This, your, your, your faith is critical in this, isn't it? Indeed. Um, thanks, Julie. Yes, uh, my participation in these climate strikes is based on those two. Plus, you know, the God I serve and the Jesus I follow gives hope. You know, God is just, God is love, and God uh, gives hope. Those three things is what I want to follow, you know, that I live justly, extend love, and bring hope to people that are suffering. This young woman and all these students we're going to hear, they're crying out for help. And the people of Fiji, where you, where you were, are associated, are crying out too. And you believe we have a duty as Christians to be good Samaritans. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm actually reminded about that um, parable of the good Samaritan in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, that's a conversation Jesus had with an expert of the law. You know, who will in inherit eternal life? love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, the same conversation Jesus had with the Pharisees and saying, you know, the, the first is as great as the second. You know, it will be hypocritical for us to say that we love God and do not love our neighbor um, alike. So, you know, for us, that good Samaritan, I see us, the Pacific Island people, as um, the people that are suffering. You know, we are being robbed, stripped of our and are left there dying. Um, you know, is the Australian government just going to walk past us or they are the very ones robbing us of our identity? <laughs> I want to come back to you in a second, Michael, if you could stay with your mic on, but Miriam Pepper, if I could bring you in. First of all, there must be some people thinking, well, what's the Good Samaritan story got to do with strike action, on, particularly on the streets where children leave their school? And, and as I understand it, you think that the disruptive action is part of Christian faith. Convince us. <laughs> that's, that's right. So there's some controversy around this idea of striking, but it's a part of the Christian story. And many people of faith um, have, have taken action um, for reasons of justice, peace, love, caring for the creation, have taken disruptive action. Um, and they, their example is none other than Jesus <laughs> and many others as well. So, you know, Jesus was, Michael shared about that, um, what Jesus called us to do, Jesus's motivation. So he took action um, for inclusion of all, for healing and wholeness uh, of all, and especially those who are oppressed, especially those who are on the, on the margins. So one story is uh, the cleansing of the temple as it's known. So in the gospel accounts, uh, Jesus went into the temple in Jerusalem uh, where there was trading activity going on, money changing um, and the buying and selling of doves. Jesus disrupted that activity. He, he um, drove the people out. He overturned the tables um, and stopped that trade. And why did he do that? <laughs> Well, he did it because um, this was part of the exclusion of the poor and those people who were considered to be unclean. So they had to buy doves for ritual sacrifice. Um, so, you know, they had to pay money for that. That was impoverishing. Um, so it was action against um, structures and practices that kept those people excluded. So that's controversial, that action. Um, you, yeah, it caused the authorities um, to be very unhappy indeed so you know that's the Jesus that we follow um you know maybe not what I originally grew up with but have come to understand that those kind of actions and there were others that Jesus did as well um you know love um and striving for justice lead us into those places and if I could ask Liliana to half fair Williams to join us uh, she's joining us from Darwin hello lovely to see you there can you just tell us a little bit more about the connection between your faith and your deep interest in First Nations spirituality and your support for this kind of climate action? Sure. So um, echoing from what Michael was saying, I, I believe in a God of justice, peace and love, and that motivates me to contribute to and support efforts for uh, a more equitable, sustainable and just human existence. 
uh, in this way, my access to postgraduate uh, education can be a useful tool for me to promote uh, alternative systems of sustainable living that, um, that have existed for thousands of years, inherited and multi-generational local knowledge, as Alison was saying, um, if valued and used as a resource, could become a lifeline to uh, humanity and all life on earth. So in this context, when we talk about indigenous spirituality, um, I'm, re I'm defining it as a worldview that acknowledges the interconnectedness and interdependence of all life on earth. So for thousands of years, terrestrial and aquatic, um, aquatic eco-regions have thrived and continue to survive under the stewardship of our world's indigenous peoples who continue to bear the brunt and are at the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, so my PhD research shows that dominant Western systems of governance and societal progress is driven by economic growth. Economic growth is inherently ecocidal, exploitative to human beings and uh, the environment and unsustainable. So um, just to end, because I know I'm talking a bit too much, um, to me, the school strike for climate strives for an Australia that respects the interconnectedness and interdependence of all life on earth for the sake of our combined futures. In our Australian context, while we continue to put pressure on our politicians, I believe those platforms are also opportunities to promote uh, and acknowledge the wealth um, of knowledge of the First Nations peoples uh, in these lands now called Australia. So our gatherings, um, because climate crisis, the climate crisis is a, isn't an issue in and of itself in the vacuum. Uh, it is also an opportunity uh, for truth telling and I'll end in that. So I just want to come back if I, wave, um, if I may for a moment to Miriam Pepper. You talked earlier about disruption being uh, a classic Christian behavior. You even quoted Jesus in the temple. Um, one or two quick examples where you think direct action, which may even have involved arrest, um, uh, was justified by Christians to achieve positive social change. Um, yeah, so Julie, before I would say that, I would say that the history of social movements um, shows us that disruptive action plays an important role in achieving change. Um, so Christians have been involved in the great justice struggles um, through history. So for um, civil rights, desegreg desegregation, decolonization, um, land rights, workers' rights, um, votes for women. Uh, so, so, you know, so for me as a middle-aged, middle-class Christian woman, <laughs> there were middle-aged, um, middle-class Christian women um, and all sorts of women involved uh, and have been and still are across the world uh, in, those, in those types of movements. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, modern movements for justice and peace, so Christians involved in ecological protection, um, in peacemaking movements across the world. So Martin Luther King Jr., so Baptist minister in the United States. So he, he's a towering figure um, in the current understanding and practice um, of these kind of disruptive actions. Um, so, uh, and he in turn was inspired by Gandhi, uh, by Christian tradition, by Jesus, by the early church and different um, examples throughout, throughout history. You've got a piece of Isaiah there. I think, you know, we've got, we're having some poetry tonight. Let's have Isaiah introduce this piece. Why are you reading it to us? Yes, Julie. So I'm going to read um, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. So this is the prophet, Hebrew prophet Isaiah. So I'm reading, if you can see that, no, this is from the inclusive Bible, the inclusive <laughs> Bible that I'll read. So um, in Isaiah's prophecy, um, God speaks. So, so God denounces empty religious ritual, so fasting, and says that fasting without action for justice um, is worthless. So I, I read here from Isaiah chapter 58 um, from verse 6. This is the sort of fast that pleases me. Remove the chains of injustice. Undo the ropes of the yoke. Let those who are oppressed go free and break every yoke you encounter. Share your bread with those who are hungry and shelter homeless poor people. Clothe those who are naked. 
and don't hide from the needs of your own flesh and blood. Do this and your light will shine like the dawn and your healing will break forth like lightning. Your integrity will go before you and the glory of God will be your rear guard. And also, you know, Jesus, the annunciation of his ministry in Luke's gospel, he read from the scroll of Isaiah and claimed this ministry um, of letting the oppressed go free, sight to the blind as his ministry. I'd like to welcome now our moderator, Reverend Simon Hansford, uh, to join us in the chat pit of the screen. And uh, the moderator, of course, is the first among equals. Um, I can't yet see you. You're at the moment an invisible first among equals. But if I could, uh, ah, here we here are. Am. Welcome, <laughs> sir. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Look, G'day, Julie. <laughs> what are you thinking? You've just seen an amazing cross section of your church. What's what's your well? I'm just, well, I'm I'm consistently incredibly proud of our young leaders in the church. There's conversation in the church about you know the young people of the church of the future, and that's just a waste of my time. They're the church of now. They're the church actively speaking in the marketplace, in the community, in the world right now, and calling us to challenge, to change, and challenge now. While we were in the in the conversation, a tweet a tweet came through on my Twitter feed that said. Hope for an alternative future brings us into contradiction with the existing present and puts us against the people who cling to it. So we're talking now about change, not for the future, but for the now and change now that'll change the world ahead of us. And these young people who are articulating and challenging us, it's fantastic. And it's and in the best sense of the word, it's the gospel in the world, engaging in the world, proclaiming hope in the world to change now and for the future. Tell me, uh, right at the beginning of this, I read the resolution where the Synod in New South Wales ACT, you know, backed the voices of young people. And even this event, yeah. where, you know, this is about giving a yeah. voice to really quite radical young people. What, where, <laughs> how does that link to the Christian faith and the Uniting Church's understanding of our role as Christians? For you? Well, well, that's a great question because the thing is, what we're on about is being the church in the world. That's what Christ calls us to be. And these young people are reminding us of that. And I think for a long time, the church has been nervous about getting into the community because of what the community might say. And these young people, and many others, of course, too, are reminding us that our place is to be sharing the gospel and arguing the gospel in the best sense of the word arguing in the world around us. We're called to care for the creation and for our human beings all around us. Of course we are. But that part of that care is engaging in the conversation about how we can best be the church in the world. And sometimes that, that engagement is sacrificial. It costs us to ask those questions and to have those conversations because we may lose friendships or risk them because we're asking to change how we live our lives. Yeah, that's